So in this video, I want to talk about uh, panel data designs, where we measured uh, many people on a few uh, occasions. So first, uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, how you can uh, measure uh, people. These are slides by uh, Adam Heimacher. Um, so basically, we can think of uh, possible data collection as this uh, Cattell's uh, data box, where we can have uh, people, yeah, Mesh the multiple variables on potentially different occasions as well. So, so far, we've been looking mainly at data that is just like one slice of this. Right, where we only measure every person on one occasion, but we could have measured people also on multiple occasions as well. So, uh, in the cross sectional approach, which we have been using so far, although uh, SEM will also allow you to uh, model other kinds of data, of course, as well. Um, we have a single snapshot of this, so we have one occasion where we measure people. And uh, there is uh, quite some problems with this uh, uh, approach. It has been argued a lot also in, uh, in, uh, in recent research. Um, one is mainly that there might be a difference in, uh, within and between subject effects. And these you cannot really capture that well in the cross-sectional data design. And that's really uh, mainly if you interpret the uh, cross-sectional data design as being one occasion. Right? If you have data that asks you about like lifetime averages or things like that, then this is less of, less of an issue. Uh, but if you really ask uh, how you're feeling now, right, or something like that, then uh, this might be a big issue. So. Um, I really like this example, for example. So we have, uh, let's say we have data of uh, people typing a text. We ask people to type a certain text and then we measure the number of words per minute, right? So the, the, the speed and the percentage of uh, spelling errors, the typing errors. And then uh, if you look at a cross-sectional design where we only have uh, one text per person, uh, we might get a relationship like, like this, right? So we have like a points in this class, so it's a negative. Effect. Yeah. Um, but it could be that if we look at multiple uh, observations per person, right, we might find that each per person had a positive effect. So within a person, when that person typed faster, the third can make more spelling error. While in the cross sectional data, we saw that whenever person, or people that type faster had less spelling errors. Right. And this is really the crucial difference between within person relationships which might be different from what you see between people. All right, so between person relationship would then be on the stable means of this. All right, and that uh, might be actually a very negative slope here. And then this cross-sectional relationship is actually sort of uh, in between. So what's happening here? Well, in this within person relationship, uh, we can see that whenever a person types faster than his or her average, so if I type a text faster than I normally do, then I would make more spelling errors. But between people, a person that on average types fast, on average makes less spelling errors simply because these people are more experienced in typing. Right? So this might be people that uh, do uh, that type text for a living. And if you then look at the conceptual relationship, you don't really make a distinguish, uh, you can't really distinguish between these two. And this is uh, one of the reasons why people really like now to uh, look at uh, like panel data designs or perhaps even uh, time series designs so that you really can make a model per person. Okay, so the panel design uh, would be a uh, few snapshots. All right, so now we have measured uh, some people on different occasions, right? So let's say one, two, and usually you need three or more for these models to work. And then one uh, uh, model that you can fit on that is called the uh, cross-legged panel model. So now uh, what we have is we have a, uh, observed items, right? Like Y2 here and Y1 here. Yeah. And then we measure them on measurement location 1, 2, and 3. And well, one thing we could do is actually model a latent process. We could also model like a single factor out of correlating over time. That would be a dynamical factor model. But let's say we have a latent variable for each of these observed variables, measure the time point one, time point two, time point three. And uh, we can even model uh, an error if we keep, like, for example, this uh, constant, this uh, error rate. 
So now we can see from this model um, how well um, variable 2 predicts variable 2 at the next time point in these regression slopes, which you could even use to draw a network, which you sometimes see. So that's a cross leg panel model, and you can implement this in SEM, and they're very, uh, very popular models. Now there's one problem with it, and that is that it doesn't adequately separate within and between subject variants. And that is because um, if I am a person that on average just always uh, makes a lot of spelling error, then knowing that I made a lot of spelling errors at time point one allows me to predict that I make a lot of spelling errors at time point two simply because I am a person that makes a lot of spelling error. Um, another problem with the caustic panel data model is that um, you need to model the variant covert matrix at time point one separately. So that means that, uh, oh, this here is an exogenous covariance that you need to model. Well, these could be the same because they're uh, like innovation covariances. Right. Now we can uh, get around this. So one thing that you see often is a, a random intercept where we add like another intercept to model this between subject effect of stable averages. And that's uh, pretty important to do. If you do do a, a, a caustic panel model, you need to add this random intercept to um, to make it work. Now, uh, in Psychonetics Package, I've implemented also a variant of the caustic panel data model where, um, where you can also model um, your relationship with a gaussian Wöfke model. And uh, that also takes this uh, part into account where I use a certain uh, decomposition um, to um, take into account that uh, this uh, correlation between items of time with one can actually be known if you assume stationarity. I will upload a paper on that to uh, Canvas so you can read it in more detail, but uh, I won't really go into detail on that here. Another very popular model that we've been seeing recently is the latent change score model. And this you can actually fit with only two observations, but you can also uh, use more if you want. And the idea in the latent change score model is that you model change as a latent variable. So here we have a uh, observed uh, item. Yeah, at time point one and at time point two. So now uh, let's say uh, Koch at time point two, we can see that as being cognition at time point one plus change, right? For a person, let's say uh, I, a plus change and um, and the change is simply the difference. So we can model that in the SEM model by fixing this part to 1, right? This is 1 times that, plus 1 times change, yeah? One times, and no error here. But this thing has a variance. Yeah, so uh, the, the, um, the change is a variance. So what you then, uh, what you don't want to take into account is also the mean structure. So this has an intercept. You don't want to explicitly put an intercept on, uh, on Koch 2. Right, so you don't want to add here also an intercept because the intercept should already be in a change. So maybe on average people change with like, um, like two points or something. Yeah? And that actually allows you to perform a test as well. So this thing here, if that's zero, then that means people don't change. Right? So that's a uh, similar to a repeated measures t-test, for example. Now you also get this uh, uh, parameter here, which is called the self-feedback parameter. Usually that will be negative, and that's a weird thing that has to do with regression towards the mean. And that means that if you um, had an extreme score at time point one, you predict the uh, most uh, uh, reduction because you predict a score around the mean. Right? So if you throw dice two times, the one time you throw a one or a six, you predict because you predict it will be 3.5 on average. You will see the most change in those scores. So you see this being negative, and that's not really uh, yeah that's. That's just what it is. So if you see a negative uh, regression parameter here, you have to be careful that you don't overinterpret that because that's just regression to the mean. But the nice thing about this is that we can test this hypothesis here about change. Right? We can also put a latent variable model here and put a, a change model on the latent variable structure. So that's what I did here. I have here a latent variable model right here. And then we can model if uh, people actually change on the latent variable over time. And that's a bit of a different hypothesis than just putting a SEM uh, arrow here. 
right now we would put uh, this change core model here and we can test this, which is nice. Now another very powerful thing that we can do with latent change core models is we can add multiple items as well. So then we can look at uh, how these change cores relate to each other, right? So here I have two items, uh, let's say con cognition and uh, new, I guess it's like neural things or neural systems like that. Um, so now we can look at how does these changes correlate, right? So if a person changes a lot in one variable, does the person change a lot in the other variables as well? And we can look at these very interesting coupling parameters. Right, so this tells me that if I scored high on this variable on time point one, then I predict a larger change on the other variable at time between time point one and two. And that's very strongly in line with the mutualism model. It turns out that the G factor model, uh, latent variable model and mutualism model, can be compared to each other using these uh, latent change score models because the, well, this will not be zero in the G, but it will be structured according to a certain way. And uh, if we fit this latent change score model, it will not be structured according to a certain way, or it can be uh, more general. So there's a green freedom difference in them. And we can test that, which is a very powerful thing. So uh, that you can also look at these papers uh, by Rogier Kivit, where he did a lot of work in that. And that will allow you to test these kinds of uh, hypotheses, which is a very nice thing. All right, that's a very brief primer into panel data design. So it gets much more complicated, actually, if you really go down into the details of these things, uh, which is interesting to look at. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of these two uh, models that you might see if you uh, read the literature. And of course, the latent growth curve model that we also discussed in, uh, in SAM1 already is also panel data design as well. So that also fits into this uh, line of models.